now. Join National Geographic on assignment. On this edition, have you ever wondered how they get those pictures? Go behind the scenes with cameramen who put their lives on the line to bring back these spectacular shots. Their lenses go to the summit of Everest and the battlefields of Vietnam, beneath the Antarctic ice and up in the treetops of Borneo. These dedicated professionals push the limits of their craft when National Geographic takes you on assignment. Behind every exciting film image is a cameraman. Behind his camera, he is unseen and forgotten by viewers, but dangerously exposed to his subjects. Sometimes with only the camera between himself and mortal danger. Other times separated from danger by the flimsiest of protections. But always driven to shed protection, to get out of the cage and push even closer stretching the limits, pioneering in places where the limits are unknown, stretching luck and boldness until limits are found and exceeded. The cameraman is David Brashears, shooting a climb on an ice face in New Hampshire. Keep going. While the climber thinks about climbing, Brashears thinks about climbing and shooting, about camera position, angles, focus, and changing light, about storytelling, lenses, equipment. He thinks ahead and climbs ahead. The job is never over. You don't crawl into your sleeping bag at night and just go to sleep. There's always some fooling around with equipment, loading a magazine for the next day, uh, being uh, more prepared than the other people have to be. Doesn't matter if you're cold, doesn't matter if you're tired, it doesn't matter if you're hungry. You just do it. By the 1920s, cameramen were traveling to exotic and faraway places to film wildlife and adventure. And one of the most spectacular locations was Africa. Americans at home had never seen such images as these. They were thrilled by them. This was the golden age of photographic exploration. Carl Akeley was an extraordinary figure of the times, an American taxidermist who went to Africa to collect his own specimens. Trying to shoot a leopard, he only wounded it. It counterattacked, and he managed to kill it with his bare hands. Akeley's insistence on recording accurate details for his taxidermy led him to photography, and his frustration in filming fast-moving African scenes led him to invent a better camera for action photography. In Africa, Akeley joined forces at times with the celebrity filmmaking couple Martin and Osa Johnson. As filmmakers, the Johnsons were less interested in documentation than sensational entertainment. <laughs> Crocodiles are especially wicked. They will pounce upon the unfortunate victim of a capsized boat like a pack of wolves. We begin to feel uneasy lest one might charge the boat. And this surly monster does, almost upsetting us. For all their showmanship, 
The Johnsons are recognized today as intrepid and talented filmmakers. Their movies, even with moments that now seem silly, were remarkable achievements. It must have been incredible to go there with primitive cameras, primitive transportation, and how they actually got any material out of it, out of Africa at all, was a miracle. Wolfgang Bayer, whose photograph wildlife in all sorts of conditions all over the world. Of all the animals that I filmed, I, I must say the uh, primates are probably the most uh, enjoying, enjoyable ones. They are so much like us. Like the orangutans, we had to climb 150 feet tall trees in Borneo in order to go up in their environment. Everything else before has been filmed from the ground up. They were right above us, they peed on us. You know, I'm looking up there and what are you going to do? You hang, you're totally helpless and some orangutan decides to pee on you. And all you can do is just keep your head low and uh, hope he doesn't do it too long. Chasing animals over the years, I've been bitten, scratched, uh, attacked, and otherwise mutilated by coyotes, cougars, leopards, jaguars, baboons, chimpanzees, and of course numerous little creatures. Luckily, nothing really poisonous. Uh, nature and, and animals give me so much enjoyment that, what the hell, a few bites and a few diseases and a few injuries here and there, not gonna kill me. In 1914, motion picture photography reached into a new realm, underwater. John Williamson, a cartoonist and photographer for a Virginia newspaper, had a showman's ingenuity and a father who'd built a 30-foot flexible steel tube designed for underwater salvage work. Williamson climbed down into the tube through the window of an observation chamber he called a photosphere, he took still photos in 1913. And in the next year, the first moving pictures ever taken underwater. What remained to be done, of course, was filming by a cameraman who swam freely underwater. An Austrian zoologist, Dr. Hans Haas, was among the first to try to connect diving and photography. In 1939, Dr. Haas filmed underwater scenes that enthralled audiences and fired the imagination of future divers. Giddings has shot countless ocean documentaries and the underwater segments of features including James Bond movies and The Deep. Doing so, he's amassed a vast library of underwater footage. But he's best known for his work with great white sharks, shooting them at first from inside a protective cage, later going outside the cage. The first time out of the cage with a great white it was certainly a, a ticklish experience. And I went out six or eight feet and kept the cage at my back. And the first animal that came near, I lunged forward a bit, uh, not totally convinced that he was gonna move off, but it worked. And I continued to move further and further away from the cages. And eventually, the last time we were in Australia, I had five whites circling the cages and me, and I was 30, 40 feet away with animals swimming between me and the cages. You always have apprehension, but driven a bit by the hum of that camera and the spectacle, you take a calculated risk. Giddings has taken his chances not only with the ocean's most fearsome creatures, but also with its most formidable places, like the hypnotically beautiful 
but perilous waters beneath the thick ice at the North and South Poles. Diving the North Pole, and for that matter, Antarctica, I think represents the toughest diving that I've done anywhere in the world. Surface conditions, north and south, 60, 70 below zero. Uh, water temperature, 28.5. A canopy of ice over your head, in most cases, eight, nine feet thick. Antarctic diving is very, very, very tough. Tough on the gear, tough on the people. You're still concerned about bends. You're still concerned about all the problems of shooting and making images, but again, you're going through a hole that's 30 inches in diameter, 40 inches in diameter, and you've got a limited air supply, and you're on the bottom perhaps 40 minutes, and you know, you're gonna run out of gas, and you've gotta find that exit hole. Arctic diving is also some of the most beautiful diving that I've done. It's really a, a fairyland of sorts. You have to be gutsy and you have to be motivated. The best ones are driven. They want to excel. They want to come back with images the likes of which no one's ever seen before. The camera goes to war. Each day it records the courage and heroism of our troops in battle. But rarely do you see the camera and the men behind it, who risk those same dangers to send back their stories and pictures. In World War II, top filmmakers, including John Ford, John Huston, William Wyler, and Frank Capra, produced war documentaries working in Hollywood with battle footage shot by military and civilian cameramen. The amphibious invasion of the Pacific island of Tarawa in 1943, one of the bloodiest battles in the history of the U.S. Marine Corps. This is the Army Navy screen magazine Cutting Room, where a combat film taken by Army, Navy, and Marine cameramen comes in from battlefronts all over the world. The Marine Staff Sergeant with the Expert Medal is 22-year-old Norman Hatch from Boston, Massachusetts. When we went in on Tarawa, the only experience that anybody had had in the Marine Corps doing a war story on film was Guadalcanal, and that was almost nothing at all. And so consequently, uh, when we got ready to go, it was sort of uh, like an improv situation, you know? Uh, everybody makes it up on his own. We had the exits covered with machine gun and rifle fire. The Japs kept coming out, trying to knock out the machine gun. There's a squad of them. A lot of good guys from the outfit weren't there anymore. I'm glad I got these pictures, because when you remember the roaches you've been fighting and the things they represented, and when you saw the flag go up and remembered the freedom that flag stood for, you knew you were in on a good thing. In 14 days, Vietnam, a different war and a different breed of cameraman. Cameraman Norman Lloyd, on assignment for CBS News filmed and recorded these scenes when Bravo Company moved into a large communist bunker complex six miles north of the Vietnamese border. Norman Lloyd from Australia was a school dropout, a kangaroo hunter, a bar fighter, a loner. He went to Vietnam on his own, replaced a CBS cameraman who was missing in action and stayed four years. He won two Emmys and made a reputation for courage 
verging on craziness. There was a lot of competition between the three networks for bang bang footage. It was very important to get bang bang footage. It was action, it was what they really wanted. The pressure coming from New York, there was a lot of pressure on, on people, on correspondents, uh, uh, on crews, if someone wasn't getting the story. And, and, and this led to deaths where, uh, where people would, would do silly things because of the pressure on them. And they'd go out and they'd get killed. And, and uh, this definitely happened. And, and, and other people were killed with them because of the pressure. Norman Lloyd's countryman, Neil Davis, reported and filmed combat in Southeast Asia for 11 years. He was a legend among Vietnam cameramen, a master at covering combat. When Saigon fell, Neil Davis was there, filming the panicked attempt to escape the bloodbath expected when the North Vietnamese recaptured the city. Neil Davis chose not to escape. He stayed behind awaiting the conquering army and making some of the most powerful images of the Vietnam War. I didn't believe that there was a great danger as long as it survived the first few minutes of the communist occupation, where it's always very dicey, where there might be uh, flare-ups and fighting immediately. Most people had left the streets. The civilian population had gone inside their houses and waited. I had decided the presidential palace was the place to be. And I went there alone and waited for them, and I thought I wasn't going to miss this end to the story. I had a moment's uh, hesitation as the tank was approaching. And a man with a weapon raced towards me, screaming in Vietnamese, stop, stop, stop. Well, I kept filming and we got quite close and uh, I rehearsed my bit before, which was in Vietnamese, welcome to Saigon, comrade. Uh, I've been you know, waiting to film the liberation and uh, I had no qualms about that, I had it all right. And he said, you're American. I said, no, I'm, I'm not. I promise I'm, a, I'm an Australian and I've been waiting for you. So he hesitated and then some troops were coming out surrendering from the palace and he hesitated then dismissed me and ran past and I was able to then start filming again. In 1985 Neil Davis was shooting a coup in the streets of Bangkok, a tame event compared to the heavy combat he'd survived so many times. But on this day an exploding tank shell hit Davis and his crew. His camera dropped on the pavement was still rolling as he was dragged away. But he was dead. And his sound man died a few hours later. Neil Davis was a guy that really had seen it all. And it was just a shame. After you see so many people get killed, after you see so many civilians get killed, you see so many children get killed. You go a little insane. And uh, I used to drink all the time. Uh, I thought of suicide a lot. It's taken years for me to, to get myself back together. Um, but, uh, but I'd do it again because I know that uh, people have got to see what war is and, and, and what it means and the futility of it. Mount Everest, a symbol of towering, irresistible challenge. Its grandeur has always inspired awe and noble effort. But Everest is also a killer. Over 80 climbers have died on it. Many more have come down broken and defeated. The summit was first reached in 1953 and then by a second expedition before an American team tried it in 1963. This team, 19 men, had a dual objective. To reach the summit, but also to film it. 
to create a documentary that would become the first National Geographic television special. The climbers were punished by Everest's devastating weather. Temperatures 20 below zero, winds blowing at more than 60 miles an hour. The altitude and cold induced nausea and headaches. The expedition's professional cinematographer, Dan Doody, was stricken with a nearly fatal blood clot. His climb was over, but lying in his tent, he taught a crash course in mountain cinematography to a pair of climbers who now got the job as movie makers. On May 1st, climber Jim Whitaker and the Sherpa, Gambu, reached the summit, planting an American flag, but taking only a few snapshots. Luke Gerstad, with the movie camera, and his climbing partner, professional still photographer Barry Bishop, were still a long way from the top. Climbing is scarcely the word for what they're doing now. They're barely creeping. Five breaths to a step, then a rest, then more steps, more breaths. Bodies aching, minds numb. Even with their flow of oxygen, they can barely breathe. They can barely move their leaden feet. But still, they do move. On the morning of May 22nd, they launched the final push. As alone as two human beings can be on the face of the Earth. is a sight to lift the heart and bring tears to the eyes. After three weeks, Jim Whitaker's maypole still stands fast with old glory streaming in the winds of space. These are the first moving pictures ever taken from the summit of Everest. Twenty years later, David Brashears reached the summit and beamed a television picture to a satellite station for broadcast a week later on an American network. Twenty-five years later, 1988, pictures from the summit were seen live on TV around the world. Thus, the dream of Captain John Knoll was fully realized. Captain Knoll who carried the first movie cameras on Everest in the unsuccessful British expeditions of the early 1920s. His film continues to amaze mountaineering cameramen, not only for its clarity and coverage, but also his pioneering ordeal. He lugged heavy equipment. He developed the film himself on the spot, working in a mountainside tent, filtering glacier water, burning yak dung to provide heat to warm his chemicals. His film preserved the memory of the climb and made a legend of its tragic climax. Climbers George Mallory and Andrew Irvine struggling to within 600 feet of the summit before disappearing forever. Noel and the others watching through telescopes then waiting anxiously as a search party led by Ennio Odell went up. The emotion of that moment 64 years ago is still keenly felt by Captain Noel. He is 98 years old. The top of the North Pole was a shelf of ice. And Odell, when he'd made the search and determined after two days and two nights that the men were dead, it just lost. He went up and he found that tent and he found these pieces of oxygen cylinder and he came back and he gave us a message by signal. We had no wireless telephone in those days of unknown. He put a signal out of cross blankets 
And the photograph I got, the best photograph I made in my life, was a circle made by the high piled lens at one and a half mile range, showing the cross blankets and showing the men walking away. And people asked me, what do you see? I couldn't tell them. I was overcome. I couldn't tell them that you get the signal. They cross blankets meant Mary and Irving <laughs> were dead. Almost 30 years passed before men reached the top of Everest. Almost 40 years till Lute Gerstad fulfilled Captain Noel's dream of moving pictures from the summit. Captain Noel, filming a heroic quest on a great mountain, was one of the first of his kind. As the era of the action film cameraman was just beginning, he embodied its bold and adventurous spirit and made a lasting contribution to the tradition of cameramen who dared. Enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library.